Well, first, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to a brief journey, which we hope is going to show you things which you might have not seen. And in this journey, we're going to talk about white boxes, not about this white box, of course. And we hope to we can find things together which might not even be there and find keys when they are not even there. But first, let us be gentlemen and introduce ourselves. I'm Cristoforo, then there is uh, Eloy and Job, and uh, we are here to present uh, uh, some research that we have done and we, which we would like to share. Um, but this would have not been possible without our colleagues at Riscure, which goes a big thanks. But before, let's say, diving into the, the rest of the presentation, let's understand the what and the why. So what are we going to talk about and why we're here? Well, we're going to talk about white box cryptography. Uh, can I ask you the onion, how many of you has heard or knows about it? Can you please raise your hand. Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed because in my previous test before, actually, uh, I mean, the, the ratio was about 1 to 10. So I think that this audience is quite well educated. This means that uh, I hope all the messages will really go through. Well, as you know, most of you know, actually, this is intended to protect keys being entrusted in a very hostile environment. Actually, it's going to be the most hostile one, as we are going to see. Well, we are going, we, why? Why it's important? Well, it's becoming increasingly relevant, the white box scenario. And the usage of white box cryptography in the, is increasingly relevant in security solution. In what is actually protecting some of your assets, some of your most beloved things, including money, as we are going to see, is a, this is a very relevant aspect of your security solution. We are going to share also about an idea, an idea that we had, we thought, it could be worthy of pursuing, such as porting hardware attacks to software. And this is actually the, the novelty. The hardware attacks might be already known to some of you, possibly not to others, but it's the angles which is uh, the intuition that we had. Different angles and different perspective, which might really change a few things. So a new exciting direction, and we got really excited when we understood that it actually works. And it's a, a very good job in extracting keys out. So an extremely effective approach, both in timing and knowledge required. We are going to see very soon. And also, we understand this is not relevant only for white box cryptography. Basically, it's relevant for any software-based crypto solution. So if you have a crypto algorithm in software, if you have a, a key in memory, or not in memory somewhere else, merged with the algorithm, like in white box, this is going to be relevant. OK, but one thing at a time before an introduction on white box cryptography, which I'm going to present. Then we are going to the key recovery attacks, and Eloy and Job are going to guide you through all this path we are going to visit together. And finally, the conclusion. We'll see what does change to white box, to crypto, to any digital ecosystem that you're probably living in at the moment. OK. Well, cryptography has been around for almost, I would say, 4,000 years. The first signs of encryption actually dates back to 2000 before Christ. And the problem has been mostly one in all this time, being either solved with Enigma or with Caesar Cipher, only one. It is a, we have two friendly party which tries to communicate with each other. And it is an evil party which tries to get ahead of the, con of the content which is transmitted. So the problem here is how to protect confidentiality of the message. And in the black box scenario, which is being modeled in cryptography, typically the attacker is only able to observe and alter just the transient messages. Of course, this has been very useful to describe things until we started having cryptography in hardware. Then the model had to be augmented with gray box model, where the cryptography operation is performed, let's say, in a smart card. And the, it, it is uh, actually in uh, a device, in a system, which the attacker has access to, where he's able to observe and alter both ends of the communication system. 
So if an attacker is able to observe and alter also the devices where the crypt operation, either encryption or decryption is performed, this is what we are called in a gray box scenario. As you can see, the gray box scenario is a bit more hostile environment than the black box, because uh, you're actually trying to have a successful and secure communication, even in a situation where the attacker has access to the same device where that you actually use for encryption and decryption. Well, this is what has been done up to now, but something has changed in the last, latest 15 years, I would say, for a number of reasons. We had internet, we have the mobile and portable devices, of course, and we have also now uh, the digitalization good. We have a, a digital economy. Basically, now you can access some goods which actually you can copy at infinitum. So this, the, the model does not work necessarily on only the encryption of the content. I mean, if you want to use something as a user uh, and have access to that, well, basically, this is what you are uh, going to get nowadays, along with the key. So now the model shifted from the confidentiality approach to the authorization. So when you actually buy something, you actually buy the authorization to use it. And everybody is going to be really happy in enjoying this at the moment. But this goes along also with, uh, with your payment, of course. Well, actually, nowadays we pay with our mobile phones. So it's easy to understand that uh, crypto in you know, all this uh, uh, solution plays a very big role. And what happens if actually the attacker is the other party? which is actually the real shift which has been there in the latest 10 years, 15 years. There is an attacker which in principle will allow you to have free access to all of this, and also free access to all of this. So this is the problem. This problem is that how do you fend, defend from an attacker which is actually the one consuming the goods that he's, he's buying? So this is the white box scenario. In the white box scenario, actually, there is a process, of course, of encryption, normally. This is a process of decryption, and actually, attackers are the other hand. So the question is, how can you make the user consume and use what he has bought without defend, defending from scenarios where you can actually, the other party can be an attacker? Well, of course, this can happen also on both sides, depending if you call that encryption or encryption. In the white box model, it is assumed the attacker has full control, full, on uh, one end of the communication and on the device. So you are able to completely inspect the cryptographic primitives, its internal, and whatever. How do you hide a key? Because that's the whole point of this. Well, this has been demonstrated in 2002, where uh, a white box model has been um, uh, showed. It has been showed how to translate the AES and the SLS algorithm, for example, into a white box implementation. The white box implementation actually allows to merge a key into a given crypto algorithm. So that the key, by making use of lookup tables, the key is actually completely merged within the tables, the, within lookup tables of the algorithm. This is a very simplistic explanation. We are not going to go much deeper than this. But basically, the whole idea is that as you have a, a lookup table for an S-box within a, an, any crypto algorithm, you can actually modify the lookup tables in order to take into account the effect of the key, such as the execution of the crypto algorithm will give you the encryption or decryption with that specific key without having necessarily the key uh, able, uh, available in plain text. So basically, there is a, a removal of the distinction between the keys and the crypto algorithm code and implementation. Let's have a look how a typical software implementation works. In the white box model, basically, the attacker has access to all of this. There is usually the business logic of the application, there is an IO, an exchange of the key, and the crypto algorithm itself. In the white box model, the attacker has access to all of this. He's able to eavesdrop all the IO communication towards the crypto, all the key, and he's also able to modify at will the business logic. Complete access. Reverse engineering exploitation will give you access to the full code which is running, and you actually modify that. How is possible to protect a key in this very hostile environment? Well, nowadays, there is two layers of protection. One, you think, is to merging the crypto algorithm into the white box crypto. 
such as that key is hidden within the crypto. But of course, you also like to make difficult for an attacker to evaluate the web of crypto, to even access that. So there are a more additional layer of protection. Well, the first one is actually obfuscation, of course. So the, there is control for obfuscation of the binary, and also this data obfuscation. And it can be can vary in complexity. This can be really, uh, really difficult to remove, if possible at all, within the given time that you have been given. Or uh, it might be very easy just to bypass. Sometimes not even needed. Well, you have anti-analysis, anti-tampering. We are talking about here uh, the, for detection of anti-debuggers, for detection of debuggers, and detection of emulators, so that you are not able to step the application and understand its flow while it's being executed. And if you try to, let's say, pull your hooks and modify your application, there are also layers trying to prevent this. And finally, the device binding. This is very important because even if you are not able to find the keys into an application, you can always take the application from one device and run to another one. Basically, you have, it's like that you have copied the key. Basically, you don't, you don't know the key, you have copied the execution. So this device binding is very important in order to make sure that that execution only happens on that sample. And this is nothing to do with WebOS crypto, but we are telling you that that protection is usually there. The talk is going to focus only on the web of crypto party. They are not going to discuss at length all the rest. We we'll focus on attack on this part, and but with all the consideration at the end, we also made with this respect. But this is what we are going to see probably into a, in a properly protected application. Well, how does this work? Well, basically, you see that a crypto algorithm is uh, actually a function of an input and a key. And then you get a plain text output, of course. Well, basically, these are typical, let's say, rounds of uh, an algorithm. In principle, every function which has uh, a matching between an input and an output can actually be completely replaced by a lookup table. A lookup table where we actually looked based on the in index of the input, that is the actual value of the output. So regardless of how complex is a function, you can always do that. If you have a, a two-value function, let's say as a, a cipher text and a key, you have a, a row and a column, and there it is at the output. This is just to give you the concept. We are completely aware it is completely unfeasible to do for uh, the full mapping of an input of a crypto algorithm, 128 bit of AES for with, uh, with actually with, uh, with the output. Well, good luck in building such a table in time and in, uh, in space. But there is one point which is important. First, the key is only used in some specific point in the algorithm. So this means that you need to actually build a lookup table for the full algorithm, but only in the parts where the key is used. So if where the key is used is actually merged within the algorithm, then it just disappears. Also, basically, all, some part of the keys actually influence one part of the intermediate data. So this means that these tables can be smaller. So that's why uh, Wibos Crypto implementation of these algorithms does look like a flow of lookups across different tables, depending on the implementation. Keep in mind that these tables take into account the effect of the specific key. So this means that these tables will be different for each keys, And you will not know which key, and we'll see why. So basically, the first thing that when you construct a um, um, white box implementation is the following. Let's have a look at the S box. This is the, no, don't think necessarily at the specific S box of the of the of the algorithm, but it's just a, an example to show how it's possible. But I think in this case, like that is a, a table implementing actually a part of the algorithm. Then you have a key. By substituting, replacing this full thing with a, a proper lookup table calculated with that key, you can merge these two things. So the result of this operation in one lookup table here. So basically, you can replace here this with this one, where when you run through T, you have the same output as you that you run through S with a key. You just replace that with one mechanism which we have just uh, seen. Of course, this is not enough, and the reason why because uh, the S box that we have just, uh, just talked before is actually known to everybody. It's public because the algorithm, algorithm are public. So if you're able to inspect the modified table and compare that with the tables which are outside in the public part, then you are able to understand which is the key. 
So basically, by analyzing the, uh, modi the modified table, you are going to get the key out. So that's why you are going to merge something else, which is random. You take any function which is a bijection, and you take which has an inverse, and you put a decode and encode, and you actually merge all together. So this means that th because this is random, the final your final t prime will be different and will depend from the key that you used and from the randomization that I use. Okay. At this point, when you see that t, you're not able to get the key out anymore. So basically, we're going to see something which is something like this. Let me show you a bit better. Uh, it's not. Okay. Control one. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you see, this is a, a an implementation white box of AES. As you see, that is a just a chain of big lookup, and the original algorithm is not there anymore. Okay, let's continue. But in this case, it's possible also to do something else. So the input arrives completely unchanged, in this case, and you get the output completely unchanged. What is changed also only the internal representation. It's called that internal encoding. But in principle, it's possible another thing. That you add another layer of decoding and encoding over here, and that the sending process starts the, the um, respective encoding part. So this means that the inputs already will be created and encoded, and you have no control and visibility on, uh, on this input or the original one. It's just transformed. And in this case, it also transformed again. So this is what is called external encoding. It would provide an additional layer of protection against attacker, but the problem is that this is not really easy to implement. There are so many interfaces in the system, so many um, different interaction with different parties. And all these parties have to understand this encoding in order for this to work. So this is possible, it's, but it's not really practical, not easy to implement. So we're going to refer to a situation where mostly the internal encoding is present. And we're going to discuss just briefly at the end about the external encoding. The potential attacks we are going to discuss are the following. Well, the first one that we are going to discuss is a fault injection. Basically, we are going to manipulate data in order to get the key out. The second one that we are going to discuss is a, a fault injection based on the process manipulation. And there is a third one which we are going to show is a, how comparing a white box implementation against the normal implementation will give you the key. What has been described up to now? Well, all the academic implementation of an attack and the proposal actually focus on the key extraction. But there are a few assumptions over here. The assumptions are that the type of transformation which are implemented in the web crypto are known. And while actually the transformation which is in there when you have just this binary blob which you don't, are not able necessarily to understand is assumed not to be known. So this means that there are attacks only if you know what you are confronting with, what, 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 is, what is implemented. And it's very easy to show that this is possible, but it's very difficult to recognize which implementation is in there in the blob, which is uh, difficult to analyze. But in real life, we saw we don't know much about design. And basically, uh, at the current state, not many publicly documented side channel and fault injection attacks or web proxies are published. Well, recently there's been a paper. Uh, from, with a DPA-like attack, and the others call this differential computational analysis. But we're going to know more about the attacks, and Eloy is going to continue and guide you through. Okay. Um, Thank do you. you hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay. Um, right. So now we know a bit about what box crypto. We know what it is. So it's about transforming algorithms so that we cannot get the key easily. Like, you cannot put a breakpoint and dump the key. Now we're going to move into getting keys. Um, so we're going to discuss two attacks. I'll discuss one. Um, Yob is discussing the other one. So I'll start with fault injection attacks on white box crypto. So as Cristoforo said, this is about modifying the white box execution such that the results are not the ones that were expected. So it's not going to compute the right ciphertext, but we're going to see how we can use that. So 
specifically, we talk about differential fault analysis attacks. Um, these are attacks that basically from injected faults, so from pairs of correct and incorrect uh, ciphertexts, so outputs of the crypto. It could be pl plain text on decryption, so it doesn't matter. It's the output of the crypto. You can, uh, with an analysis algorithm, you can get the key back. So basically, I will do a few runs of the crypto. I will inject faults. I will collect this data. I will run some maths over it, and I will get the keys. So I'm going to tell you how um, how we do that for DES. So I'll explain step by step how that works for DES. Uh, but the important part here is this is not DES specific. This works for DES. This works for AES. There are uh, DFA attacks for like Camellia and some obscure algorithms that you might have never heard of. Um, this was first introduced in 1996. So that's many years ago. And this is usually done um, on, um, on hardware. So we typically just use lasers or glitching attacks or that kind of attacks that you might have heard about um, and try to get the keys out. So we'll see how we can do that on Whitebooks Crypto. So, well, let's move on to a bit of this. Um, this, what you see here on the screen, is the last couple rounds of a DES cipher. So first, you have the data that goes through the cipher is split in two halves. So we have right and left. Um, the right half goes into an F function, which is just a, a round function, uh, together with the key. So this merges, or this uses the key to compute the output, and it XORs with the other half. Now, the two halves are swapped, and we repeat this over and over again. So we do that for this 16 times. And this is all in the standard, right? So if we just look at this and write an equation out of it, then we get this part where we don't know anything about the key, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't do an attack. Um, and we don't know this one because it comes from the previous processing that depends on the key as well. So what happens if I now inject a fault in there and make the output different? Only from that part. So what came here was the same, but then this will be changed and this will be changed, but this remains constant. So what we get is another equation in different terms, but still we have the same two unknowns, the key and the left half from before. Now we can XOR them and we get only one unknown, the key. So hopefully with a little bit of maths and of computation, we should be able to solve that equation and get the key, right? So this would give me the round key, the last round key. And for this, I will need to get another round key and put them together to get the full key. Or I could put it force because there are only eight bits missing from that round key to the desk key. So how do we solve this? If we go one step deeper, we go into the F function, this is how it looks like. You have the key on one side and you have the data on the other side. The data runs through some expansion function which just copies a couple bytes, it duplicates them. Um, and then it XORs it with the key. And then these, which are 48 bits, gets put, gets put into eight S boxes, six bit into each X box. So that means that actually we have independent sub keys. So the keys are used six bits at a time, which is kind of easy to, you know, to solve by brute force. We just have 64 possibilities. So we run through all of them, and we see which ones give me a solution for the previous equation. If they give me a solution, then the key is a potential key. If they don't give me a solution, then that key is invalid. Now, because there are six bits input, four bits output, there have to be some losses here. So what we get is not one key that is a solution, we get two or three keys due to this lossy part of the, uh, um, the S-box. Now, if we do this again with a different fault, slightly different, we will get different inputs, so we will get a different subset of possible keys. Again, two or three. And hopefully the overlap of those two sets should give one key. Otherwise, we do it again, and then we get one key. So at some point, we get one key. Um, now, if I do this for every S-box, I get 48 bits of key, so I have the round key. So I can compute backwards to the output of the round, to the input of the round, sorry, and apply the fault in the previous round, and repeat the attack. And then I can get the full key like this. Did I more or less explain fine? Okay, um, right. So, bottom line, we inject faults before the last round. We compare them, we break them in small brute forces with a divide and conquer approach, solve those equations, and if we do enough faults, we should have the right key. 
so typically we, as I said before, we use lasers like this one. This is a small smart card holder and then some lasers coming in. Um, we do that on, on smart cards or on uh, SOCs in hardware. But how do we pour this to the white box crypto case? Well, if you were listening in the beginning, you see it's software, right? So we can just, you know, inject faults at any place with anything that allows us to control the software. So what we do is um, we first locate more or less where to inject the faults. Then we, uh, we collect, we start injecting the faults and collect enough pairs of plain text and ciphertext to break the key. And for that, we can use a multitude of options. We can use debuggers with scripting like GDB, or we can use emulators like QMO or Unicorn. We can use dynamic binary instrumentation, stuff that every reverse engineer is used to you know, use on a daily basis. And we can use that to automate this process of injecting faults. And then finally, we need to do the fault analysis, which is what I just explained before. So we just need to compare this, do some maths, and hopefully get the key out. Um, for this, we use our own tools. That's uh, it's Inspector. It's a commercial tool. You can see it later on if you come by the booth. Um, but you also have, for example, ex uh, DFA examples on GitHub. So you can go to GitHub to search AES DFA, and you'll see some examples there. So we're gonna analyze a target, which is called WB Des. This target is um, basically a Des encryption. It gets a plain text, and it gives you a cipher text. Uh, and it has a key hidden within the target. It's not like a binary byte array, but it's there in the lookup tables. The key is there for reference, but I'm not gonna put it into the tool or anything. I'm gonna show you how, how it gets out. Um, so this was a challenge that was posted by uh, Brecht Viseur in uh, 2012 at whiteboxcrypto.com. And so we're gonna use it for all the attacks that we do today. So here is uh, a VM where I have the target. So I can run the crypto, and you can see that it says, well, I need a plain text. So I'm going to pass the plain text to it. So I'm going to use this WBS, and then just not zeros, right? So this encrypts. Um, and the key, well, I tell you, it's not in, in there. I opened it into IDA. It's not in there. Um, but we're going to see how this can, how we can extract the key. So I'm going to run a script, which is called run uh, DFA. And while the script is running, I'll tell you what it's doing. OK. So the script is there. Um, so the first step, as I said before, was locating where to inject the, the crypto. This plot here is a plot from the accesses to memory by the device or by the, by the crypto while it's running to the stack memory. In red, you have the writes, and in green, you have the reads. So basically, for each memory read or write that we see, we give it an index like 0, 1, 2, 3, just consecutive, and we plot it here in the right color. Now, what you see there, even though this was a white box, there is some nice pattern here that repeats. So there is, if you count, there is 15 of these lines here, and that's actually almost the rounds that, that there are in a DES. So this is very likely to be the DES execution. So we want to be towards the end, so that's going to be our target area. And I'm going to use the IDs as references. So about 40,000 and 50,000, that's my range where I want to inject faults. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an instrumentation program that just selects a random target in that window from 40,000 to 50,000. And then when, the, when a data read happens in that window at, around that target, we will just change it. And that will inj inject a fault in the crypto. So in code that looks like this with Unicorn, it's basically, well, if the event ID, which is basically incrementing here, is close to that and, um, yeah, and if we want to fault it, because we can fault, we want to fault only once every run of the crypto. Then I just write back a value that has been XORed with a random bit. So it, it's very simple. It's just like there was this in the memory. It's going to be read by the program. So I'm going to just flip a bit in there. Um, so that's what my script was doing, and it was it was just um, yeah, it was just injecting fault, saying faulting at 42,000, 46,000, blah 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 for a hundred times. Now, I open our tool here, um, and I will open from my 
location where I created the file, I created a trace file for our tool, which is here. So you can see down here, where I will zoom in a moment, and then, uh, well, you sort of see, there is the input, which I set to all zeros, and there is the output, which starts with an 18, and now there is a hoover here that I cannot get rid of. Um, this is the first execution where I didn't inject a fault. I want it as a reference, and then everything that comes after has faults. So if I run from here, from the crypto place, I run the DES differential fault analysis module, which looks like this. Uh, this module can attack round 16, round 15, if you know the key for round 16, or both of them. So if I just press the go button, I get a nice graph, and I get a key down here, which is the key on the screen that I showed before. Um, what is important here is that you see the difference between the top candidate and the next one. So if that difference is big, that means that this solution appeared many times compared to the next one. So the second one appeared 50% of the time of the first one, uh, of, of, yeah, of the first one, so that means that there is quite a big confidence that the result is correct. So to, to make sure that I'm not cheating, I have a Python script that I will show you. So, so you see the Python script is just basically getting the key from the, imp the parameters and the plain text and using PyCrypto to encrypt something, right? So if I do Python, uh, maybe I will put it up. So if I do Python, I paste my key in, uh, and then I paste, I give my input. The result should be the same as when we run this WB desk with the input. So that proves that the key has been recovered correctly. Okay, so let me close this. So that, that was a quick demo of how we break a key with uh, DFA on desk. What else did we do for this, uh, for this project? We also compared this for a few other uh, public white boxes on the internet. So we did this for this challenge that I showed you, and we get like 40 faults, we have uh, enough to get the key, and you saw that this took like the time that it took me to go through two slides. Um, for these other two challenges, they are yeah, very simple challenges, but they also get the same numbers. So we could break almost every challenge that, that was there, and the difference was that this latest one is actually encoded. So it has external encodings, which is what Christopher was mentioning before. That means that the output is not the real output of the DES, it's just randomized with some encoding that I don't know. So if the output is randomized, I cannot solve equations with it because I don't know anything about the actual output. Um, so that gives you a hint of what this can do to this kind of attack. Uh, but we'll see now a bit more with uh, with Yop on another type of attacks. There we go. Okay. Oh! <laughs> I hear myself. <laughs> so, so what does it mean that you can test the hypothesis? Um, you can predict something in the cipher. You don't take the input bit. You take something in the cipher that you try to predict. Say you say, let's say the key is one. What would then, given my input data, be uh, the internal data? And then if I'm wrong and the key is not one, then I won't see anything in, in, in my subtraction because that effect is not there. But if I'm right and I have the right key, I predict the right internal value, then I get the peak again because apparently the power still leaks. I mean, that's a preposition that the power has to leak something about the internal state. Still, guessing the key from a one or it not being one is still a huge space of key to, to, to guess. So I would like to reduce my guesses. Comes the picture again. All the ciphers internally tend to break a key in pieces. So again, we have the fact that we have six bit of key that independently causes an effect in the cipher. So if I can just guess the 64 keys, I can make 64 predictions do 64 subtractions, and if I only get one peak, or I take the highest peak, then I have this independent search, I repeat that eight times, and I break the whole key. So that's the conceptual, let's say, principle of doing a differential 
power analysis or side channel analysis attack. Going back, so generalization. We take measurements, and again, in, in, we're talking now also on software, so we have to redefine what the measurement is. We take predictions of what subkeys could be and what the effects are on the input data that we generated. And then we use statistics or methods to choose which one is, let's say, what shows that, that impact. And what we just discussed was difference of means. Just you take the means, you subtract them. You could also use correlation or other more sophisticated analysis techniques that have been developed over the years to make side channel attacks more effective or more threatening. Of course, you do this for all the keys together, then you have the final key. So that, that is the attack model. Um, now, what happens if you do this on a software implementation of AES that is not obfuscated, not, nothing? Well, then this is a trivial exercise. Why? Because the measurement will observe exactly the value that you're predicting. So it will be 100% match. The, the thing that the white box does is it randomizes all these internal states by these random encodings in between that should really make everything random. And when I make a prediction, then the prediction should be completely defeated by the fact that it is random. That is what the white box should protect against. So to our surprise, well, of course, it's been already too much, let's, let's say, um, alluded to the fact that this now works. I was looking for a picture that shows, let's say, on the internet, surprise. Um, in the end, I ended up actually on our own uh, corporate website where we have this uh, personal people that work there, and I have my own there. Um, <laughs> apparently, this, this feeling is something we have more often in the office. Um, but that is the feeling you get when you do this. It, it really works. It works out of the box, out of the white box. Um, so again, uh, this is principle, this is technique. So how does it work in practice? Um, again, we have to measure. We use tools to measure, let's say, the intermediate values of, of crypto algorithms. You execute the white box multiple times and you have to change the, the inputs. You could also observe inputs that are part of the normal execution as long as they are random enough. You collect them with the data and the measurement in a usable form, and then you perform your side channel analysis. How you do the side channel analysis, uh, we use our own tools for that, but also on the internet you can find open SCA or chip whisperer projects that also deal in the same type of attack um, that would be relevant to this. Um, yeah, maybe say something about the, um, the techniques that you need to, to get the values out. <clears throat> and we have used a, a whole range of these techniques. Uh, you can do instrumentation. Uh, PIN is for Intel, a, a well-known tool to get for every instruction execution a callback. You can lock your data. You can lock the addresses that are used. Um, we have used um, GDB with scripting to just uh, hit the breakpoint, capture the stack, and then write it to disk. Um, we've used emulators, Panda, to record an execution and then change some values, replay, change some values, replay. So there are various techniques that you can use. Um, and then you have to capture it in a certain form. And, and here is a difference with power measurements. We are used to getting 8-bit samples from an oscilloscope or something like this. But now you're getting memory values, um, and they don't have a, a high power level or a low power level. Uh, they have bits, and all the bits are equal. So for this type of attack, you tend to go to bit um, binary traces instead of like these full byte uh, traces. But you can capture anything. Again, you can also capture low um, address bytes because they reflect indexes into the tables that we have in the white box, and they can leak information. And the final step is to, um, yeah, to execute the analysis. Um, and uh, I will show, let's say briefly, how that now works again in our this event. Oh, same key, same implementation. Uh, let me quickly go to this again. Ah, typing backwards is challenging. So we have the same binary here. We have Python script. And 
what this now does is it, it does the same, well, it's breaking off a bit, but you see the random inputs going in, the random outputs coming out of every execution run, and it um, shows the number of samples that it uh, took, because that is easy for our tool to, in, to import the, the data again. Um, and it would, yeah, it's almost done, so I can switch to this tool. Um, we have a slightly different module to import, so we have a tool called binary import. Right. There it is, so I can, well, load it as bytes or bits, so as, as I said, I will now load it as a bits. How does it look? Well, so it's not very visually interesting. Um, it's not easy to see round one and round two. There are ways to get that information from this kind of collection. So if you take more data, it becomes more clear even at this analysis where your rounds are. So you, there are different ways to plot this. Um, but for now, it's an, sufficient to just run our so-called DES advanced analysis module, which is a bit of an overloaded GUI. Um, but just encrypt. We are using differential uh, analysis. We are attacking round one. Those are the most important things. We run it. Shows a bunch of output, but at the end you recognize again um, the key. Oh, the wrong button. So the key here, and and something you can see here. Where's my pointer? Is we have some values here. Those are let's say correlation kind of values. They they indicate the the likelihood that this candidate is good. So we rank them on that, and in, important is the difference. So. How bigger the difference, how more likely this is a good candidate. And of course, we can verify it because we have input-output data, just, just do the calculations. But again, you see, we find the same key. It's a fairly straightforward uh, method of analysis and, uh, and as an attack. Okay, now I go back to the presentation. Two final slides on this topic. Um, again, we did the comparison uh, with um, the public um, challenges, as it were. Um, like we said earlier, there is a paper out by NXP. Um, they showed uh, also results and, and they fully, let's say, or we fully, um, um, uh, let's say, confirm their results. Uh, you see that sometimes our values are a bit different. Uh, the middle two ones you see because they don't have random encodings. So in that sense, they are not true random white boxes. That's why they're so easily broken. Uh, for one, we have many more traces but you have to realize this is only 10 minutes more of analysis time, so it doesn't really matter. If there was a million, it's still within the realm of, of attack. And again, also for this one, random encodings on the outside of the algorithm um, are, the, are a barrier. And that's good to remember. So what does it mean? A, there is no detailed knowledge required about the implementation of the white box for the rest. So how do they did the tables, uh, where the rounds are, you, depending on how you do your tracing, you don't even have to know exactly where it's being executed. As long as you have enough memory and a bit of power on your computer, you can use all this analysis much faster and, um, uh, and take your time and find it. The other thing is no manipulation required. All these countermeasures of anti-debug, anti-tamper make sometimes the manipulation uh, challenging. For this, that isn't necessary. So it's a lighter, let's say, prerequisite. Um, so the the random input output encoding on the external side is, is the only barrier left. But like uh, Christopher said, you also have to decode it somewhere. So finding this encoding is not always also an obstacle. So after finding that encoding, then this still applies. So that's good to keep in mind. Um, yeah, that's what this says. So, Christopher, yeah. wrap up. I guess it's... Well, basically what we have seen now is something which should be a bit quite surprising. At least it was really surprising for us. With fault injection, we were able by modifying bits in memory to completely get the key out of, of a white box script implementation, where supposedly the key is not even there. Well, it's uh, strange to get a key when it's not even there, but basically it is just hidden in the white box uh, cryptographically. But by Modifying this memory and understanding the output and playing with the output we got, well, we were able to recover the key. And this is exactly what is done in hardware. This is the whole concept that we actually are injecting fault by, let's say, in software, in memory, by using software. So software attacks for attacking a software white box. 
Similarly, what has been done for uh, side channel analysis with, with as uh, Job has shown, well, basically, we don't even need to manipulate anything. We just need to record the execution flow of a program, nothing more. Basically, this can be done with any crypto program, even if the key is, is in there. This technique will probably work, even if the key is actually in there. But sometimes, you need to go through reversing, through understanding, to, to understand where the key is there. In this case, you just lock the execution of the program, you analyze, and you will get the key out. Of course, the problem is uh, much more relevant in the case of white box crypto, because uh, actually the key is supposedly hidden in the algorithm. But in other cases, as you have seen, it might be really significant in the fact that after recording execu some executions, you get the key out in three minutes, which is, uh, we thought it was uh, quite outstanding in terms of attacks against uh, a supposedly secure white box script implementation. So the question is this, is it dead? Well, I would say that it's hardly breathing at the moment, at least what, but let's see why. Is it programs are useless? Well, basically we've shown that this is really effective. Basically, we've shown that there is very limited knowledge of the target required. Well, if you're doing fault injection attacks, you actually need to know, perhaps, where to inject the fault. But in principle, you could just run, just inject faults in random without having that knowledge and just see the output. And then at that point, it would still be doable. And still, the very limited knowledge required might be go to down to nothing. Well, in some cases, especially if you have some kind of additional software countermeasures, like the one I described at first, well, some reverse engineering skills might be needed. And of course, you need to apply some countermeasures to this uh, implementation in order to make it work. And also some risk mitigation might be also needed. We've seen this also when you're open source and commercial web of crypto, of course, there is uh, much more work to do to bring the real stuff. But we can actually share something. It's not everything so going down to crumbles, of course. This is not regular software crypto. So it's not something that you just say you reverse and you get the key out. There is more, the, com the attacks is, in the end is more complex. So it's actually porting to software some attacks which have been uh, developed by crypto experts in hardware, basically. So the software protection layer we've seen can be in a huge deterrent. And basically, you know, if you actually apply renewability of keys, because it is possible, to this kind of solution, well, if you actually break a key, but then it actually renewing every time you need to change this and re-perform the attack, well, this might be a quite a good deterrent as well. So how to make it stronger? Well, of course, you need to apply Wibos script, of course, but first thing, you need to make sure that there is a very good layer of obfuscation of, in general, software protection layer which prevents the attacker to easily interact. I mean, in the end, if you're not able to, let's say, instrument your program in order to record, basically you cannot perform any of this attack. So instrumentation of the program is the first thing, basically. Once you're actually there, basically what the, the outstanding defense, the last stance is uh, in the white box crypto. It's, Basically, the industry knows of countermeasures. They have been described in papers. It's probably the, not the typical papers that uh, software attackers uh, typically read, but it, they are there. So they are known to the industry, they are applied to hardware. So there is hardware which is very difficult nowadays to attack with, uh, with this kind of attacks. And the same concept as we ported the attacks from hardware to software, the same software, uh, sorry, the same concept can be ported to software. There are some limitations, and we say might discuss a bit this uh, of offline. For example, how do you get a good random source in pure software? Well, that's a very important thing to discuss. But for sure, there are possible countermeasures which are can be implemented at this level, which are already available. So, basically, for side channel, you need to prevent that there is a dependence between the key and the behavior of the program. Because if the program behavior does not depend on the key, even its analysis cannot reveal the key. Nowadays, what we have seen is that the access to stack was, for example, depending on uh, the round. So we, we were able to see this. So the first thing is uh, 
try to prevent this dependence. The second thing is uh, apply randomness. For, again, this is still the same thing that uh, applies. If you're doing a fault, well, we actually modify memory. But if you don't check the memory, we're free to modify it, of course. But if you check it once, twice, if you actually, there is a, a change in the flow and you just check only once, of course, we are free to modify no one will notice. One typical approach is that you perform double check. You check once, you check the second time, and you actually are, make sure that those two instances of check are identical. Otherwise, someone has changed something. So it's, of course, carrying the redundant data along the computation. And also, another thing is, if I inject a fault and that fault remains localized, so it doesn't break the rest. I mean, it's very easy for me to actually isolate and only attack the part. But if I change a bit and everything actually changes, then the actual analysis becomes more difficult, both from a side channel part than fault injection. So we are at the end. We will first would like to thank you for staying with us. And I would also like to invite Job and Aloy to come on stage for taking the questions. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, yes, please. You mentioned on, the, on one of your last slides about commercial vitals and programs. Did you refer to actually on one? Uh, so, uh, can you. Uh, can, can so you mentioned um, commercially available vitals. Yes, indeed. And they obviously claim to be secure. Um, did you run your tool against one? Uh, so, the tool that you presented here, did you try it on a commercially available vitals? Well, we actually said that. Yeah, the, question. the question is that if we actually tried our tool against commercial white box implementation. Well, it's not a matter of tool, it's actually a technique in general. And as we said in the slide, actually broken several open source and white box and uh, commercial implementation. So I think that is a yes. So, so the answer is yes. We have applied the attack to not only these four, but also commercial that we cannot talk about. But just to make it clear. <laughs> Yes, please. Question about the uh, DPA part, the differential power analysis. Uh, you said that it works out well. This is very surprising because, is, as far as I know, differential power analysis is usually is very specific for the, uh, for the implementation. And the white box is completely different implementation. So, can you explain? Well, yeah, it's. it's um it's not completely true that a side channel or a power analysis attack is very specific to the implementation. It, the principle is very generic. Of course, in hardware, you have um, the question of what is really leaking because of how the hardware is executing the cipher. For instance, if I have a round register that is updated with the next round register, I have a different kind of uh, switching of the transistors than if this is per S-box or something like this. So, and that matters for how well the attack works. Um, in this case, we are, um, uh, of course, still also uh, faced with choosing which one of these intermediate values works best. So that is still that still applies. In this case, we were using the round output um, of the of uh, of the first round. Um, it is surprising that it works because of the expected randomization. And if that would be full and complete, then it wouldn't work. But there's probably a relationship between how the tables are split and how big they are per 4-bit or 8-bit. You have this, this choice in how big you make the tables, right? You can make petabyte tables for the whole AES, or you make smaller tables. And typically, there's a, a choice about this table size that apparently doesn't work well enough against this. So probably. There is a design question about how could you change the white boxes to better be resistant against this. Yeah. yeah. Also, you can see that we are using address addresses and data, so program behavior. So there is a requirement that normally in uh, hardware attacks that some physical component does not leak information. I think it's quite new. Well, I think uh, perhaps it's uh, completely new. The idea that the behavior of the program can leak such information, such as addresses and data, how you address, uh, access memory, actually leak information on the key. And this is extremely surprising also for us, but 
we, we found it there, that the intuition was there, and he said, let's see if it works, and it works. Yes. Maybe another question on the DPA. You said there's a lot of things you could measure. What things did you try, and which ones were that? So what we showed was um, one bright writes. Yeah, I didn't show it in the end because we were a bit uh, on the time schedule. But um, so uh, we are only saving the one byte writes during the execution, which is only 388. It was a, a low number. Uh, we also tried it on the um, uh, low byte of the read accesses. The address. Uh, of the address. Uh, the low byte of the address of the reads. Uh, that worked. Um, yeah, so the, the reads could also, yeah. but, <clears throat> but typically that would be. Um, a read back of data that was generated during the white box because if it's a read of something that was in the program already then it cannot relate to the data right um, in the end what you could do also is go to registers if you just go to every register update you're going to have all the data however you're going to have a lot of data so it's going to take much more time to analyze so typically we would try to first identify if the data at the writes like writes of one byte size which is typically what leaks are leaking. Otherwise, we try to move to more data. Other yeah. questions? Well, if you want to know more, we are uh, first available anytime here. We are at a at booth with a risk booth that is available in the commercial area. But most of all, we also have training. We are starting to have training on this topic. We do perceive that this is a really relevant and important, which you go. You can contact us, and we will be able to provide. Uh, I think it's training. also on the website. I think it's also already on the website. Is it for January, right? I yep. guess. So you already have that, and we'll be very glad to tell you more about this. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh